Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about the history of cable television and how it has impacted politics and why we will be talking about what ends up on the screen. We're also going to look at what happens behind the screen, including what happened and what happens in the legislative halls of Congress and how regulation and deregulation plays a critical role. My guest for this is Catherine Kramer Brownell. She's associate professor of history at Purdue University, and she's the author of the book that she joins us to talk about. It's called 24-7 Politics, Cable Television, and the Fragmenting of America from Watergate to Fox News. Catherine Kramer Brownell, Brownell, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this program. Thank you so much for having me. I, I was interested to learn from your book that the origins of cable television date back to the 1940s, which surprised me. I know that television itself has a history beginning really the start of the 20th century. But my mom, who was a kid in the 1950s, used to tell me how when the first time they got a television inside their house. So I was I was a bit surprised to learn about the origins and the beginning of cable television dating back to the 1940s. What was happening in the 1940s and what was cable in then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cable television really emerges with broadcast television. It becomes a way for people who are outside of being able to access the broadcast signals, which initially were in big cities like Chicago or New York. Um, and so it becomes a way for someone who's maybe lives quite a distance uh, but can, can't access the signals due to terrain or distance uh, for them to, to access broadcast television. So there are early entrepreneurs who would climb to the top of a mountain uh, to get that signal and then they would relay that signal via a wire and so the early version of cable television was actually called community television because it was about giving that that community access to television that they wouldn't really have any um, access to otherwise was it publicly owned no. Uh, so th that's, you know, one of those really interesting things in cable television's development. It could have gone a variety of different ways. In the beginning, it was someone who saw a business opportunity that had engineering experiences, uh, could get, could run those wires into to homes from the top of a hotel, for example, um, and then charge a monthly fee. And so it was a business uh, from the beginning. So I suspect that that is part of why we have this sort of diff different evolution of cable television compared to broadcasting television. Well, initially, cable was just seen as an extension of broadcast, yeah. right? So it was just a service. It wasn't anything to challenge broadcast to, to provide something different. It was just to extend broadcasting's reach. And then it really develops, and there's a huge debate over what cable television could be in the 1960s as people begin to become frustrated with the limitations of broadcast television, which at the time is controlled by a, a monopoly of the, the big three, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And that's really about it. Tell me more about broadcast television and, and this big three and how they present to the world. And when we say broadcast television, it's simple enough. It's like how people are hearing our conversation over the radio. It, it's it's broadcasted over the air and picked up by antennas. Uh, tell me about the legacy of the, and tell, and tell me about the complaints of at the time in the 1960s about broadcast television. Yeah, so broadcast television always touted that it was free, right? You just needed to you had those antennas, um, and once you had those antennas, then you didn't have to pay a monthly rate. And so they celebrated that this is, you know, free TV is uh, what broadcasters would call it. But it was heavily commercialized. Of course, um, people aren't paying out of their pockets each month for a subscription, but they are paying with their time during a lot of lengthy advertisements. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of criticism that um, it becomes becomes more focused just on getting advertisement uh, advertisers on board rather than actually fulfilling the other component is its its public interest role because broadcasters had a monopoly they were regulated to have a monopoly um, uh, they argued that this allowed them to deliver better programming uh, it allowed them to make a lot of money too but they had this public interest requirement that they also had to serve the, the broader public and contribute uh, to the civic process and and they did that through the news 
And so news and public affairs programming were a way that broadcasters uh, showed that they were contributing to democracy, uh, upholding their commitment to the public interest. But again, even those news programs were very limited in terms of what they saw as, and defined as the news. It was very exclusionary, um, very elitist uh, from a white and male perspective as well. It helped enforce this, this monoculture that, that we wouldn't have had before. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's very much about creating consensus, a, a shared culture. But the criticisms that emerge in the 1960s um, come from uh, civil rights activists and feminists, um, from conservatives. People across the political spectrum, people were frustrated that this was a shared culture, but again, it was also exclusionary. Um, and they wanted their voices and their perspectives to be involved. And so that's why they pushed for different forms of television and cable emerged as a potential solution. So are these are these these groups civil rights activists, feminists, conservatives, you know, some of the different groups from each other are are they all involved in pushing for more cable television? Yes, uh, that's one of the really interesting things. The 1960s is this very divided time, and the people who are clamoring for cable television um, disagree on almost everything, <laughs> but the need for more television access. And so this demand for more TV access really intensifies throughout the 1960s as it becomes clear that TV is shaping political discussions. Uh, TV is shaping um, legislation. TV is helping people win elections. Um, and so that means that it's not just perhaps the president uh, who, uh, you know, who overwhelmingly is controlling what becomes known as the televised uh, bully pulpit. Uh, members of Congress want to be on TV, too. They see it as their path to power. Um, activists inside and outside of office want to be on TV. They see it as their path to power as well. It's interesting. Why, why do they have to, to push for this? Why can't just a, a cable provider do it on their own? Well, initially, um, there are regulations. Um, again, regulatory policy is so important and often really overlooked. Um, during the 1960s, cable television was highly regulated. Those same regulations that gave broad broadcast networks that monopoly limited cable so that it could not compete with uh, broadcasting. It could not provide an alternative. Um, they uh, Cable oper operators couldn't even compete in the top 100 markets. Uh, so they could only extend the reach of broadcast Broadcasting, rather than offer something um, different uh, that would compete with broadcasters. Um, and this was because of federal policy. And so that's why the push to deregulate cable or to rethink regulatory policies to maybe have it be federally funded or a nonprofit, all of these are really floating around in the late 1960s. Cable was, was seen as the ability to strengthen participation in the dem democratic system. Yes, that was initially the many activists saw, again, access to TV programming, control over TV programming as central to a right of citizenship um, in this age of television. And so they pushed um, for, you know, for, for more opportunities, which cable provided. On the other hand, you have cable operators who embrace this language of democracy. They see that criticizing network television, um, embracing kind of these democratic impulses can be very good for business because they're interested not so much in advancing democracy, um, but they're interested in throwing off these regulations that are really limited, limiting the markets in which they can compete. And so they embrace this idea of cable as a democratic tool, as a political strategy. Who were these cable companies then? And do we see them in any in, in the legacy? Do we see their legacy in cable companies today? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, you, you know, yes, if you kind of chart uh, the, the trajectory, you can kind of see that there are a lot of mergers that happened. Um, one of the really interesting things is that um, uh, cable companies and broadcast companies, Hollywood studios, all of these things were separate entities because of ownership rules. that You couldn't own all, all different um, media. You had to have one, right? And, um, and so you couldn't dominate uh, the, the entire media marketplace. 
Well, that changes in the aftermath of 1996 and the Telecommunications Act. And so a lot of them merge. Um, and so they aren't necessarily, they don't operate by the same name, uh, but you can kind of trace their history uh, back. What, for example, one of the companies that I look at in the book is TCI. And its executive, John Malone, is a huge player in cable television, um, especially moving into the 1980s. Uh, TCI becomes one of the biggest, uh, um, the biggest companies uh, in the, the cable companies in the entire country um, and then it later goes on uh, to to you know merge uh, with a uh, um, a, a telephone company in the aftermath of um, the 1996 Telecommunications Act. So we don't know it as TCI today, but the, the legacy is still there. John Malone, the head of TCI, is still very involved. He was involved in getting CNN off the ground, and he's still involved um, in CNN as well. What were the early regulations then? Uh, is it in the 1960s when we when we get these regulatory changes? So the, the major point, a turning point uh, that I argue in my book, which I just find uh, was one of the most exciting parts my, my, about my research, because it just it it showed how important some of these political biases and political agendas are to shaping regulatory policy. And that is what happens um, under the Richard Nixon administration. In 1968, there are all sorts of different possibilities for cable's future. Um, and indeed, Lyndon Johnson. Johnson had had a task force that he had compiled these research and one of the recommendations was a federally funded infrastructure of you know developing cable television in that capacity uh, but then Richard Nixon comes into office and Richard Nixon sees things differently he sees the networks as biased and out to get him and he wants to take them down and he uses a variety of different tactics um, but one of them is regulatory policy and he embraces the deregulation of cable television as a part of his war on uh, network television and it really changes the trajectory um, the regulatory trajectory for cable did, did broadcasting television try to retaliate against Nixon I mean Nixon probably thought they they, they started the whole fight and, and maybe they even did I don't know but <laughs> But, but did that cause sort of a war between between the presidency uh, of the time of Nixon and cable television uh, and broadcast television? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, network executives had always had long had a very cozy relationship with the president. Um, you know, many of them were friends with people like John F. Kennedy um, and had a really collaborative and amiable relationship. Lyndon Johnson, uh, Frank Stanton um, at, at um, CBS, he and Lyndon Johnson went way back, um, especially because uh, Lyndon Johnson's wife owned uh, broadcast stations in Texas. And so there's this really, um, th there's this really strong collaborative relationship uh, between the presidency and the, the networks. That changes with Nixon. Nixon does not trust them. Uh, they, they are, he's trying to break them up uh, in terms of using antitrust uh, policies as well. Uh, they're battling, again, over information and what stories can come out. Um, and so they, they're, they're, there's this real battle between broadcasters and Nixon that emerges. But one of the key things that's different between, of course, Nixon's battle the, the, the press as well, the printed press. Um, but uh, with broadcasters, because their, their money hinges on regulations, federal regulations, Nixon really had that, that upper hand in terms of he could threaten their livelihood. Um, and he, he tried to. But he did more than that, right? I mean, we get these regulatory changes during his, his presidency. Is, it, is, it the, is this where we get the change that allows for cable, provide, cable owners to, to provide television themselves whatever they and what is it what is the change is it change now that they can bring different things other than what you get from abc nbc cbs yeah, so there are two different changes. One of them happens with the FCC that's really not linked to Nixon, uh, but is really linked to this pressure for more television activists or, or access. Um, and that is um, uh, local origination, what becomes later known as cable casting. And that is just a requirement that is imposed by the FCC uh, that cable companies that are the larger ones need to come up with their own programming. Um, so this is not, you know, this is not connected at all with Nixon's uh, regulatory 
military uh, battles. Uh, rather, it's just, you know, out of this, uh, this more grassroots push for more television access. So that is one change. Um, so there is this mandate uh, that cable companies have to think, what are we going to put on TV? Um, the other one is opening up markets um, so that, uh, and this is where it's more linked to Nixon, you know, allowing cable operators to compete against broadcasters in these top 100 markets. Those policies uh, really start to change, facilitating the, the, the franchise process for cable operators, um, you know, really kind of cutting some of the red tape that had um, made it so difficult for them to make money in some of the, the bigger markets. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Catherine Kramer Brownell. She's Associate Professor of History at Purdue University, and she joins us for a conversation about her book called 24-7 Politics, Cable Television and the Fragmenting of America from Watergate to Fox News. Watergate, how, how does Watergate fit into your story? So one of the really fascinating archival finds I came across was actually in the Gerald Ford library. And I was looking at the aftermath of, you know, so cable, or, so Nixon introduces all of these new uh, regulatory policies for television, uh, you know, as part of this broader war that he's launching against the, the, the broadcast networks. Well, now Gerald Ford and his administration is trying to deal with all of these proposed changes. Nothing actually happened in terms of policy change. Like there are a couple of regulatory policy, smaller ones that that um, that start to creep in. But the big vision that Nixon had was really halted by Watergate. Um, because there is so much attention to, you know, Nixon's abuse of power that Watergate really derailed a lot of the momentum that his Office of Telecommunications Policy had built towards changes with cable, and it really stalled. So Ger Gerald Ford's administration is now trying to figure out what to do and uh, if they should move forward on something that had become tainted as anti or as part of Nixon's um, anti-media politics, even though it had broad support for, you know, expanding cable television. So they're trying to figure out what to do. And they actually I found this they, these documents. Uh, they had economists that came and talked about regulatory policy for cable, and they used the Watergate hearings as um, a as a rationale that, wow, if we actually have public affairs programming and a different option from network television, more people will watch television. It's actually not necessarily going to destroy the networks. It's going to expand people's obsession with television. And so Watergate really starts to uh, reshape the regulatory trajectory in unanticipated ways uh, that allows Nixon's kind of um, uh, vision for cable to come to fruition 10 years down the road again the, the promise of cable at least in its campaign is to expand democratic participation uh did it do that you know it's it, it did um i i think it does especially in the, the early years uh where there is so much excitement in local communities about the ability to get on tv and to whether it's to connect with the, the, you know their their peers or their elected officials um locally uh, or later on you see um a, a variety of different experiments to engage women uh to engage black communities to engage conservatives um you things like c-span people flock Flocked isn't the right term, but people turned <laughs> to C-SPAN for this sense of community uh, and, and a conversation that they could not get on network news programming. And so I think that, that there is this democratic impulse. Uh, but what I argue in the book is it's also always tied to advancing the business of television. Um, and so it's hard to separate them. Sometimes they can work together. But when it comes down to advancing democracy or making money, uh, cable companies are going to make money. Tell me, tell me about this latter point. So, I mean, you see this, you see this time and time again, uh, you know, a lot of these initiatives to, to kind of show cable civic potential are linked to these regulatory battles. Uh, C-SPAN is a great example. Uh, C-SPAN emerges as a way that you know, Brian Lamb comes up with this this incredible vision that comes out of the Watergate hearings as well, right? Like that the 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 televised Senate hearings showed, wow, that was a really important role that television played. We can broadcast hearings. This. We can we can yeah. broadcast Congress just unfiltered exactly. as, as it is, which they do, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and again, you know, it's really interesting. The the hearings were broadcast on network television and public television. And so it's the networks that really step up during this time and show the value, uh, the, the democratic value of providing transparency, providing more in, er, information, allowing people to see the process play out during a constitutional crisis. Um, and so that legacy, uh, Brian Lamb really taps into to sell this concept of C-SPAN because in the aftermath of Watergate, the House and the Senate, they're trying to figure out how can we keep the spotlight on us now that it's not a crisis. Um, so C-SPAN comes as a solution. And Brian Lamb uh, you know, sells C-SPAN to cable operators by saying, if you want to be taken seriously in Washington, you need to do public affairs. That's the power that the networks had. They had power because they do the news. And so if you want to have political power to kind of change legislation, you need to do something like C-SPAN. And so it works. Uh, they invest in the cable companies, provide, you know, invest in C-SPAN. It is a really important component um, of giving Americans information and connecting them to their government. Uh, but it's also tied with that deregulatory uh, battle that they're fighting as well. Yeah, as a political reporter, I have relied heavily on, on C-SPAN. I've done my own hours and hours of, of, of viewing C-SPAN. But there, but there is this, this other side to it that it has been, I, I guess we could say, e exploited. Oh, absolutely. You know, that's one of the interesting things is that you introduce this new medium to Congress, to or the House first, uh, and you've got representatives, especially younger ones, that firmly believe that television is a path to power. And they see this not as a chance to communicate and give information to their constituents, uh, but as a way to build their brand. And so they manipulate uh, the, the the cable television in Congress very explicitly. Um, and you know, someone like Newt Gingrich, he, see, he saw that, wow, maybe not a ton of people are watching, but even if a half a million people are watching, there, I can get my message out. I can build a national following. And so he and a variety of other more extremist members of Congress in the, the early 1980s start to use uh, C-SPAN to, to attack their enemies uh, and, and frame it as an attack, right? And call into question the, the, the patriotism of their um, of, of political opponents. And they're using this language of war almost because that's how they're thinking about politics as warfare and using C-SPAN as a tool. Um, they're doing this in the after hours, special orders time. So special orders happen when the house business is done. No one is there. Every, everyone's uh, gone home, except everyone's for the gone. clerk, except for the clerk. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But you can, as a member of Congress, you can go, or as a member of, uh, of the House, you can go and deliver a speech, request time for special orders. Traditionally, this had been used for someone to perhaps put in the congressional record, like a happy anniversary to someone in their home district. Gingrich uses it differently. He's He knows the camera's only focused on him. So he launches into these attacks um, using, uh, you know, very, very um, outlandish uh, statements and and, um, and really um, emotional language, if you will. And people think that, oh, no one's responding. It must be true. Well, no one was responding because no one was in the chamber. And so it really was that manipulation of, of cable for a political agenda. I was a Capitol Hill reporter about 20 years ago, and I remember coming home, be late at night, I'd have C-SPAN on. And there'd be like three Republican lawmakers just going on and on between themselves. And I always thought, and I, I didn't fully grasp at the time what was going on, but, but, but you see it now in retrospect, they were, they were community, they were communicating not to a big audience because C-SPAN doesn't have a huge audience anyways, but especially around midnight, but there is a dedicated audience yeah. that they are, mm -hmm. that they are talking to. And mm -hmm. they, I mean, that was yeah. deliberate. Exactly, exactly. And, and the idea was that we don't need to appeal to the majority. Uh, we don't need to create consensus. We need to get a very dedicated minority um, ready to go, ready to mobilize, ready to work for campaigns, to donate for causes. Um, and so it's really it's this idea of narrow casting. That's what cable does. Thinking about 
putting to, stitching together the quote unquote right demographics, people who are more committed, more passionate, rather than trying to broadcast, right, which is appeal to the lowest common denominator and build consensus. And so really, cable really is instrumental in ushering in that shift towards narrow casting and making politicians see um, the value of that. And again, this is a political strategy that the lobbyists um, are hosting workshops for elected officials to say, here's how you narrow cast, here's how you segment the market, here are the tools that we use to, to attract advertisers. Why not bring them into your campaigns? Is this democracy? And, and I ask that because in, in, a, you know, in paying close attention to the history of democracy, it's, it's actually part of democracy for groups to try to exploit the, the democratic rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we all do it. Lobbyists do it. I mean, absolutely. from activists do it. Everyone does it. Mm -hmm. I think it absolutely is. And, and I, I think that it's part of how we function in um, a televisual uh, democracy, that thinking about how you present an image, thinking about messaging, how it's going to come across, how to build these electronic coalitions, um, that is central to how our politics function today. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've also hosted on, on radio for our network uh, countless congressional hearings over the last 20 years, and it has become very clear that congressional hearings are now seen as opportunities, bring on the internet opportunities to get your soundbite or meme out there, and really, rather than having a hearing trying to get to the, the bottom of an issue, it's really about using your five minutes you may have as a lawmaker in that hearing uh, to, to say something to hope that it, it goes viral and, and helps either push yourself or, or your, your, your issues. Um, Brian Lamb is interesting. He, he's, as a broadcaster, he is somebody that I actually admire quite deeply. And he is also an advocate for putting cameras in the Supreme Court, which uh, I used to 100% be behind. But, but I do question that now um, after seeing how television cameras and, and it's OK. So what, you, you don't have television cameras in congressional meetings or in the hill. Now you're blocking everyone out from being able to uh, to watch at all. So there's you know, there, there's another side to this. But but I, I but but I do kind of see an argument now why you wouldn't want cameras in the Supreme Court, because it may turn. Some argue it already is, but but it could turn the Supreme Court into a spectacle the way that kind of congressional hearings have become. Well, when you put TV in some place, people are aware of TV. Uh, they're uh, they're aware of it, and you know maybe they forget about it at some you know if it's like the entire day. But um, but I think that what we learn with C-SPAN is that when you put cameras in, people start performing for the cameras. They start thinking again, even though the goal for those cameras, um, the that I, I know that you know Brian Lamb believed in was this importance of transparency of getting the whole story, but. Again, Again, there's always a, that line between transparency and manipulation um, is really is really thin, and we you see that um, uh, time and time again. Could you have one without the other? Oh, that's a really great question, and and I honestly think that in our politics today, where it's so performative, um, and and this is not just today. Of course, you know, performance has a long history in politics, but it's so performative for television, for social media to get these ratings um, that it's really hard to think about just that 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 you're just giving information because how the information is delivered. Um, what is delivered, right? Um, even though you can push for like the full transparency, but you're, you're not always giving everything, right? It's, that, it's impossible. So how you're selecting it, how you're presenting it, how you're framing it, um, even though you can try to say, this is me, this is, you know, uh, the, the full, um, all the information, it's always selected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I try to warn people to always, you know, be a bit critical of whatever they hear in media, even on, on my Absolutely. radio program or whatever, because even the best well-intentioned attempt to get to a story is always going to miss nuance and complexity. Just the, the medium itself is is limited from understanding all the motivations that would go into whatever, whatever one is following. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I think that's the, the the important thing to know is, and that's so essential for un navigating our current media moment, is having that media literacy and, um, and, and knowing what you're getting and what you're not um, and being able to decipher that. And I think one of the, the challenges with cable television is that whether it's 24-7 news, uh, whether it's C-SPAN, there is this this air of authenticity and transparency that you're getting it because it's nonstop and there's so much information that's out there. But um, but in fact, it's just a different filter. Um, it's, it's a different filter from what we were getting in broadcast. It's more perhaps more information, but it's still being curated um, in, in that way by people who are trying to control their image, right? They're trying to get their message out, but now cable just kind of changed those dynamics of how they do it. But that process is still in play. Does the fairness doctrine fit in to your narrative? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And so the fairness doctrine um, is is really comes out of uh, you know decades long uh, work by uh, conservative activists. Um, and um, but really, it's interesting. In the 1980s, it fits into this deregulatory moment that you know cable. Uh, it's that deregulation is rooted in the 70s, and then it really kind of takes off in the 1980s as um, uh, both Democrats and Republicans uh, embrace this idea of deregulating the media environment. Um, uh, ultimately, Ronald Reagan's FCC chairman, Mark Fowler, he really pulls back um, any kind of regulatory oversight over uh, both cable companies, but also broadcasters. So he kind of tells them, like, I'm not really paying attention uh, whether or not you are serving the public interest. And in fact, he, he makes this argument that the public's interest is the public interest. Um, and so that consumerism, what, what they want to consume should be what uh, the, the goal. And so he, um, so again, he allows for many, many mergers to happen between media companies as part of this deregulation. And then, of course, the fairness doctrine uh, is something that comes out uh, that he kind of makes it he, uh, he really kind of pulls it back and says, you know, we're no longer enforcing the fairness doctrine. What's really interesting is that there is a bipartisan um, coalition majority in Congress that passed legislation to return the fairness doctrine um, because they understand the benefits that that gives. Um, you know, Democrats, if they're appearing, the fairness doctrine is, you know, is often invoked to say, well, we need a Republican um, on the other side. And so they actually understand that there are certain benefits uh, to the parties that it lends. But ultimately, Ronald Reagan vetoes uh, the legislation. And so it really sends the fairness doctrine into a relic of the past and, and really allows for more partisan uh, television um, and uh, on broadcast, on radio, of course, and on cable to, uh, to flourish during the 1990s. This radio program broadcasts on Pacifica Radio Network, which is an old uh, public radio lefty station. Um, and when I talked to the old timers, I, I wasn't around when uh, they, they with with the fairness doctrine, uh, the old timers were, were also uh, against the previous rules, you know, saying that, well, before you only got one story that was controlled by the big networks. And what we wanted to be was a counterweight to what was being put out there on mainstream to give a different perspective. And, and I think there was value to that and, and truth to that, because like, as, as you mentioned, uh, what was cons what was put out there was a very small window, a very small frame of what was allowed but looking at it today and sort of just going back to, to how media works today and in the lack of complexity and nuance almost everything is either you're telling the absolute truth or you're an absolute liar or it's corrupt or and again that's why i always try to be i try, I try to caution people be careful because there's you stories are always more nuanced and complex than what you're being told, even under the best circumstances, but we're not operating in the best circumstances anymore. Well, and part of the, the issue is that we are in a deregulated media environment uh, where the consumer interest has become conflated with the public interest. And that means that news companies um, are thinking about, they're not thinking about, you know, any civic obligation they have to present, you know, nuance um, or complexity. They're thinking about making money. There are no rules. There are no expectations um, uh, in place in terms of kind of uh, pushing good behavior, pushing, you know, um, uh, 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 any kind of 
adherence to kind of this public interest. It's all about what sells. It's all about ratings. And so I think that's why you see, you know, very outlandish um, uses um, and, and statements on, you know, whether it's a cable news program or whether it's social media, it's all about getting ratings. And I think part of what cable does, the deregulation of cable television um, and of media more broadly, it ties the democratic process to the marketplace. Um, and, and I really would also emphasize that this is not just a Republican, we think of deregulation as a Republican agenda, but it's actually Al Gore, um, who, you know, is saying that the consumer interest and the public interest are one and the same, right? This is a bipartisan thing um, that people across the political spectrum have bought into um, and and have made that our, um, our reality. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 signed into law by Democratic President Bill Clinton. Exactly. Um, and th that is this major regulatory hurdle that completely deregulates uh, cable companies and allows them to merge and um, compete against uh, telephone companies in terms of different um, services, uh, but also work with Internet providers, um, you know, uh, different tech firms out in Silicon Valley. And so you see this merger um, and the idea, you know, uh, Gore pitches it that um, this is an opportunity for a corporate citizenship to emerge um, and allow different choice for consumers um, that, you know, they can choose whether to go uh, with Comcast or AT&T. But the reality is that these companies all merge. Um, and, and so, yes, you do have maybe a slight choice, but you kind of have in terms of ownership of the, 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 the media systems, it's still, it's a different type of monopoly in the aftermath because, because of the marketplace, not because of regulation. Let's talk more about the marketplace. And, and I think we certainly see it today with, with online media, which is really governed by clicks. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, you, we, we know that the more extreme uh, a piece, uh, an article or a video may be, or more edgy uh, a video or, or whatever it may be is, the more likely it is to get clicks, the more clicks it gets, the more it shows up in everyone else's algorithm. And this, I mean, this, this is what ends up getting pushed. I mean, we see this in cable. I, I, I mm -hmm. expect we, we see it today as well on the internet. I think this is one of the legacies of cable television emerging as this deregulated medium because it becomes about how can we generate, get again, this very small but loyal and impassioned audience. Um, and it allows for experimentation, right? So some of that experimentation can be productive. C-SPAN, an experiment, right? In terms of providing more information, connecting Americans to their government um, if they choose to. But overwhelmingly, people are choosing other options. They're choosing, you know, the, the edgier programs that come out on, um, on the cable dial. Uh, they're maybe even becoming a little bit more lazy uh, in terms of expecting their favorite channel like MTV to deliver not just music videos, but also information about the world around them. Well, what does that mean uh, to MTV executives? They're delivering news as a business strategy. Uh, they get involved in the 1992 election uh, because they don't want their viewers to change the dial. They don't want to go. They don't want them to go to ABC or NBC or CBS. So they give them, they get involved in covering politics, but they're only covering a small slice of politics. Um, and, you know, they're and they're they're thinking about they're they're pandering their coverage to what they think their audience wants. And I think it's not just the ratings obsession, um, but it's that pandering of the news to attract a particular demographic that has really shaped how cable news developed in the 1990s and into today. I mean, MTV was very beneficial to Bill Clinton's candidacy, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So MTV gets involved in the 92 um, election and um, and it's offering candidates like, you know, try, they're trying. Tabitha Soren is going to New Hampshire, trying to interview people. And many, many people running for office don't take MTV seriously. In fact, George H.W. Bush, um, you know, just dismissed it and called it a teeny bopper network. Um, but Bill Clinton, again, he's he's willing to do anything. It's June of 1992. Um, it's, he's secured the Democratic nomination, but it's before the convention. His campaign is just floundering. And so he's desperate. He's willing to do any media opportunity that comes up. And so he says yes to MTV. And he just thrives in that setting. It's that kind of town hall setting where he can talk around, you know, build on his strength in terms of making connections to individuals. But it's so important that he is controlling the conversation. 
again. He is controlling their discussion of current events, not just his campaign, but these current controversies um, around his campaign. He's able to dismiss them and say, no, here's the real issue. And so it's not just using entertainment to make a quick cameo appearance like on Saturday Night Live or something. It's using entertainment to really shape people's understanding of public affairs more broadly. Tabitha Soren, you're you're really taking me back now. <laughs> Absolutely. She, you know, played such a, a powerful role in the 92 election. And then, you know, in the Clinton administration goes back to her, you know, has a town hall with her when they're talking um, about their legislative agenda. Um, and so, you know, she appears time and time again throughout the Clinton administration. Obviously, it'd be a different kind of politics. Do you see this as a precursor to the rise of Fox News? You know, it's uh, it's interesting that I, I would in some capacities because I think it's part of looking at the news as creating a brand um, and using the news as entertainment, right? It's framed as MTV news, but it's actually about creating, advancing a brand um, and like I said, kind of pandering to what they thought their audiences wanted to hear. And so CNN is a lone player in terms of the 24 um, um, hour news or cable channel. It comes on the scene in 1980 and it's not until 1996 that you get MSNBC and Fox News. But one of the really interesting things around the launch of um, MSNBC and Fox News is they're all talking about what their brand is, what's going to be their take on the news. And so MSNBC initially wants to appeal to a younger audience, um, kind of like MTV, that they, they want to, they, their shows to be hip. Uh, they, they they have a lot of younger people. They're connected to the internet, right? And so they're they're very tech savvy, and that people can you know reply to the news story online. And so they're kind of trying to embrace that as their brand. Fox, of course, takes on the brand that has proven very successful in talk radio uh, with figures like Rush Limbaugh that what if we make ourselves conservative? Uh, we emphasize fair and balanced and fair and balanced to conservatives meant something very distinctive. And that meant, you know, a conservative take on the news. Is Fox conservative because its founders are deeply conservative or it could be multiple reasons, but or, or was it also for, for, for ratings? Was it also for market? I think... I, Fox has been successful because it's brought in money. Um, uh, it's you know it's been uh, it's it's grown and become uh, so dominant in GOP politics uh, because it brings uh, because it's been this lucrative um, business uh, and it could not really become the giant that it was uh, that it is now um, if it if it didn't make money. Um, and so I, its founders, yes, they they firmly they were conservative. They believed in a conservative mission, um, but for them it was always about business first and this proved profitable and then it kind of served their politics as well and of course when we say doing it for the market uh whether we're talking about again online media or or cable media what, what we mean by doing it for the market means this is where people are flocking to it means uh it's about you know cable as a business makes money um in in two different ways uh it makes money off of advertisements uh that you know just like broadcasting did it you know initially cable says that we won't have any advertisements and then they see oh we can make money off of advertisements and so advertisements can become uh or have have been a source of funding but more significantly it makes money off of carriage uh, carriage fees. And so they negotiate with cable operators a certain fee uh, to carry their programs per household. Um, and so ESPN, as you may not be surprised, makes the most money off of carriage because there's such a demand. But it's that creating that demand where enough cable subscribers are going to insist that they had Fox News on um, or they would, you know, uh, or they would drop that service. And so it, it really it was that fine line between cultivating that loyalty where people would demand their cable operators to make sure that they could have access to something like Fox News. What is public access TV? Oh, such a great question. Uh, so public access TV is, again, part of this promise that cable television brings in the, the late 60s and, and in the 1970s. And in fact, public access starts to flourish um, uh, in, in places uh, in 
in places like California. Um, uh, and uh, there's this countercultural impulse um, on, on public access, where, again, it's an opportunity for ordinary citizens to make their own films um, and, and get their message out there. And so it's part of something that's negotiated with, uh, there were FCC rules uh, mandating that each cable operator had a public access channel, at least one. Um, uh, but then it really becomes, it comes down to, with deregulation later on, it comes down to the negotiation between the cable company and the local government uh, during the, the franch franchise process. So there's no guarantee, but um, you know, cable companies needed to in the 1980s get these franchise agreements where they could you know dig up the streets and lay the wire um, or, and actually provide those wires to get the TV into households. And so that could become a, a political negotiation that they had to provide this amount of a number of channels for the local government for public access as well almost like well, in, in different ways but but similar to c-span though for, mm -hmm. for us to be able to 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 meet sort of the the, the public good or, or what we're going to put into it you get c-span and you get public access tv exactly exactly yeah. That um, this is an opportunity for citizens to use it and to have access to it. Um, you know, many of these public access agreements initially, um, or the franchise agreements initially, pledged that cable companies would build studios to allow, you know, because an average person doesn't, you know, but this is way before, you know, iPhones. Uh, so the average person didn't have access to a TV studio. So what good did carriage help? Um, uh, if you couldn't actually put together a video. And so many cable companies initially promised that they would build TV studios, um, uh, production studios for local citizens. Um, many of them reneged on those promises. Um, uh, and again, this is part of the, the consequence of deregulation. When you're not mandating that anymore, um, companies can just say, sorry. In the age of the internet, does cable matter anymore? It does. Uh, I think it matters. and it, It's helpful to think about cable and its legacy in a variety of ways. So cable companies like Comcast, they provide the internet. Um, you know, they, they, they provide the broadcast. They've got the, this national wired infrastructure that allows for wireless access that we've all become dependent on. They've diversified, and so now they're looking at a variety, like they're looking beyond just television. But those cable companies um, still matter because that's part of how we get our internet today. Um, in terms of programming, then you have this other side. So there's always been this hardware side, right? The actual infrastructure, the wired infrastructure. And then there's the software, uh, the programming. And, and I think that, you know, the, the future of many cable programming, Pro programs and networks is really, it, that's what's really at a turning point. You know, many of them are succeeding with subscription services, uh, but, you know, others are struggling to survive. And so I think that's where we really see kind of this debate over the future um, of things like CNN or Fox or C-SPAN um, or ESPN um, or some of the entertainment or sports um, program, HBO, all of these things, some of them are flourishing, others are struggling. And I think, you know, C-SPAN is actually a great example of one that's struggling um, because carried, as people are turning for inter to internet, not uh, cable, and they're cutting the cord, now C-SPAN, which was funded by carriage fees, um, is struggling in terms of uh, to survive financially. Oh, interesting. But but aren't is, isn't cable still required to provide? C-SPAN? I always thought it was the cable companies that floated the bill for C-SPAN. They, they do float the bill, but they float the bill by charging a per subscriber fee. Right now, I think it's around eight cents. I could be wrong. Um, but um, initially it was three cents, uh, but it's now, at, no, it's got to be more than eight cents. But anyway, um, but I, so it, it's, I'm not sure the exact details of what, it's okay. it's, what they charge now, but they charge for every subscriber, uh, this small percentage goes to funding C-SPAN. Well, when more people are, are cutting the cord and opting for internet, there's not that requirement on internet services. It's only if you have a cable package. And you don't need C-SPAN anymore to watch Congress. All the committees uh, stream their hearings on their website. Um, I, you know, I think some committees do, but many of them, again, C-SPAN has been so reliable in terms of getting us congressional information, their camera crews are experienced in terms of all of, you know, so they've become part of the infrastructure. So how it is funded in the future um, is really an important question. And isn't, isn't it cable, comp cable companies that are actually providing many of us now with our internet connection? 
Yes, yes. Many. I think the majority of the the broadband market is controlled by cable companies today. So that's their way of of holding on to power. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, this, the private infrastructure um, that they built to deliver wired television is now being used to, you know, they're, they're, they're going to continue to innovate and to think about how they can del deliver new technology that is faster, right? So you went from cable, a coaxial wire, or a wire to digital, where now all of a sudden you can have hundreds of channels rather than just 50 or 60. Um, and that was a, a technological improvement. And now it's providing broadband and faster and faster services. And so again, the cable company will continue to innovate to become that essential resource um, uh, because it's part, it, their business model is uh, centered on it. This is a bit off topic as I move to wrap up here, but it bothers me so much. I want to bring it up. I, I feel as though digital rules about broadcast television ha has ruined broadcast television. Uh, if you get a great signal, I, I have an antenna on my TV. If you have a great signal, uh, the, the, it's a beautiful picture that you get. But if there's any problem, any disruption whatsoever, instead of like the old days, you get a little squiggly line or a little bit of snow mm -hmm. in the image. Not a big deal. As I was a kid, that's what I grew up with. You get used to it. Not a big deal at all. Now it just completely blocks itself out. I mean, it, it makes mm -hmm. it impossible to watch. And, and I, I, I really resent that, that. I feel like it's almost impossible now to get free TV anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I... I have not paid or I, I have paid for television um, almost my entire life. And and so I think that, you know, people have become accustomed to it. And and then, you know, they can kind of make some of these regulatory policies that don't mandate, you know, that they do some of these these free services because people don't cause controversy around it. Right. If people rate, rose the question if you know, you know, millions of Americans demanded some change then, you know, elected officials might rethink policy. But I think, you know, over the last 20 years, people have come to expect that they will pay for television. Catherine Kramer Brunel has been our guest. Again, she's associate professor of history at Purdue University, and she has joined us for a conversation about her book called 24-7 Politics, Cable Television, and the Fragmenting of America from Watergate to Fox News. Catherine Kramer Brunel, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Thank you so much for having me.